Hi, everyone. My name's Sarah Fox. Welcome to Sense of Place. I'm so glad you guys can join us tonight. We get to hear from Dr. Jocelyn Aikens tonight about some of the rare and unusual carnivores that we have here in our backyard, if you're here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Jocelyn has been working in wildlife conservation research for at least two decades, um, including most recently her work um, in conservation genetics, which you're going to hear some more about tonight. She's a wildlife biologist who's worked all over the world, and somehow we got her here in the Northwest to land. Um, and she's also the founder of the Cascades Carnivore Project, which she'll tell you about some. Um, I have seen firsthand what it takes for Jocelyn and her team to do their research, which is done often in some pretty treacherous and crazy high alpine terrain. And I can tell you that we are very lucky to have someone who's willing to put in that kind of work to help study two of our native carnivores. So I'm very excited to have Jocelyn join us tonight. Um, she wanted me to ask all of you um, before she comes on to think about if you have seen a wolverine in your life to take a moment and go into our chat box. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen and let her know. So you can just say, yes, you have. And um, if you can remember where you saw it, make a little note about that. So that's something to think about as I go through this intro. Um, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen here with you for a second and we'll take it from there. All right, so. Um, some of you are new to Sense of Place, so I want to give you a quick background on it. We are a lecture series based in the Columbia River Gorge. We typically have live events um, in Hood River, and we hope to return to those soon, but we've been virtual for now a year or so. Um, we also have a um, podcast, companion, companion podcast called Here in the Gorge. And so if you like the kind of stories that you're hearing tonight, you can go check out our companion podcast, which are basically audio documentaries that look at the natural and, and cultural history of this place. And you can listen to them while you fold your clothes or go for a drive. Um, you may see have seen that we are 12 years old. And part of that is because we have a fantastic group of sponsors many of who've been, who've been with us since the very beginning. So if you have a chance to support them, I hope you do because they certainly support us. Um, and lastly, we have got, we are part of an amazing organization called Mount Adams Institute. You may have noticed that it says uh, Sense of Place, a program of Mount Adams Institute. And we're a program of theirs, but we're not the only one. And they are an awesome nonprofit that is doing a lot to connect all sorts of different people from children to veterans and everyone in between to the natural world. And that takes a lot of work because everyone connects in unique ways. But Mount Adams Institute is very focused on figuring out what those ways are and how to make it work for a variety of different people. So with that, let me get to here to the webinar. And I wanna ask Jocelyn Aikens to go ahead and join us. And I also wanna mention that at the end of the program, we will have a moment for a Q&A with Jocelyn. And so if as we're talking and you're hearing Jocelyn give her talk, you have a question, put it in the Q&A box and we'll circle back to that at the end. I also wanna mention that if you didn't already see it after the show, um, run over to our website, um, Mount Adams Institute slash Sense of Place because a local filmmaker group, Modoc Stories, produced an awesome film on Jocelyn where you get to see her in action in the high alpine train doing what she does best. So thanks so much for joining us, Jocelyn. Thanks, Sarah. It's so good to be here. All right, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Oh, it's, I'm reading through the chats to see where people have seen Wolverines. It's, uh, it's few and far between from all the, uh, the participants here. Um, Neil, you saw one in Glacier National Park. That would be a good place to see one. Um, my sister-in-law's on tonight listening, and she saw one in the Canadian Rockies. That would be another good place to see one. Mara, Mara, sorry if I get that wrong. You saw one on Great Slave Lake. That's awesome. I actually saw my first wolverine up in the Northwest Territories. I, used, I spent eight years working up there, and that's uh, where I saw my first wolverine. I've only seen one other one. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I'm excited to talk about what uh, we have been up to as an organization for the last decade and personally what, uh, what I've been up to. So uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm a wildlife biologist um, and a conservation geneticist. So what that means is I like to spend time collecting the evidence that wild animals leave behind in nature and put that to use to understand how they're faring from a conservation standpoint um, up in really re remote and wild mountainous places. Um, I grew up hiking quite a bit in the Cascade Mountains. This is me and my dad backpacking uh, near Mount Baker. My, my mom and dad used to take us up um, to the Mount Baker area all the time my brother um, and my little sister and I, and uh, I think that's probably where I got my love for spending time in the mountains. Um, I've been studying wolverines um, and other carnivores since the mid 2000s. Uh, I've spent time working in the Canadian Rockies, studying grizzly bears and in Grand Teton National Park and Yellowstone National Park, also studying grizzly bears. Uh, I spent a little bit of time in Belize studying jaguars and uh, their smaller cousin, the ocelot. I've also worked in Yellowstone studying wolverines. Uh, by 2008, I had settled here in the gorge um, in Hood River, and I was quickly falling in love with the people and the landscapes here. Um, but I quickly realized that there was not a carnivore job waiting for me. Um, I looked around, I tried to meet people, I spent some time working at the wind farms, I returned to do some work in Alaska, uh, but I really uh, was wondering what I would do here. I just returned from trapping and studying wolverines in Yellowstone when I learned that a wolverine had been detected on Mount Adams by the Yakima Nation in 2006. So I was very curious whether this was a lone dispersing male in search of a mate, or if it was a member of an undetected population that it had just not been studied or known about. I really became totally enthralled with this one wolverine um, and what it represented. And so I approached Washington's wildlife biologist for this region. His name is David Anderson. Some of you might know him. He lives up in Trout Lake. And he gave his permission his, or his approval, you know, to start a little study. Um, he gave me about $500 and I got started. But why should we care about wolverines and their conservation? So little is known about where they occur or how well they are doing and governments are really limited in what they can do. Um, so it, there is a need for, for work to, pay attention to what's going on in the mountains where, where things are often overlooked. I'm also gonna to speak tonight about the Cascade Red Fox, which is one of the rarest mammals in Washington. And the Washington Cascade Range is the only place where these little foxes are found. And Mount Adams is actually one of their last strongholds. So both the Wolverine and the Cascade Red Fox live in the high Cascades. Even during the depths of winter, they don't come down slope like many other species do. And they're really elusive. They try to avoid people. And so it's hard to understand how they're doing as a, as a population. And we do know that climate change is really affecting their habitats. And we as humans continue to leave our mark on the landscape. We're continually encroaching on their wild habitats. And so as a scientist, I'm interested in shedding light on how these carnivores are faring in their last wild places to help ensure that they remain here. So going back to 2008, I designed a small study and I just enlisted a bunch of friends from the gorge to help me set camera stations around Mount Adams. It was a real ragtag crew. And this is what we did. We set these camera stations for wildlife. So here you can see the setup on the far right. We have one camera that's facing that red blob, which would be the bait, some kind of roadkill that I'd found. Um, some of you may know Debbie Budnick. She lives in Trout Lake and used to call me on her way to and from the gorge and say, I saw a deer on the side of the road. You, 
you know, it's that mild blah, 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 come up and, and butcher it. And so it's just like any source, I was just getting bait and, and attaching it to trees. And below the bait there, you can see the hair snagger. So that is a webbing belt that has wire brushes on it. And it allows, it allowed me to collect hair samples when the carnivore visited. You have a thing up on the top left there that is like a scent lure that brings in the carnivores from further afield. Uh, hang it high as high up in the trees as we can get. And then often there'd be a second camera just to get another view. Carnivores can be quite timid at these stations. And so it just offers another perspective. And this is the landscape that I was dealing with. So we have high mountains in the goat, goat rocks in the foreground, Mount Adams in the background. Um, carnivores, these carnivores that I study, they stay up high and so um, we were focusing on getting as far into the mountains as we could and um, uh, detecting, you know, seeing how they moved between these high elevation areas. Here's an image of the setup from the camera's perspective. You can see the green is the webbing belt with the hair snagging brushes and the, the, I've highlighted the bait there in red. So that's, that's what it looks like um, from one of the camera photos. Uh, the research is best done during the winter, and this is because food is most limited. Um, many species are hibernating or have gone downslope in the valleys to avoid the harshest winter conditions that the, the mountains provide. And this is when the carnivores, the foxes and the wolverines are having the hardest time surviving. And so they're more likely to visit the bait and set the, the camera to trigger a photo. So really, I just, as I mentioned, enlisted friends, we would go out cross country ski up onto Mount Adams as far as we could go from some of the snow parks you may know, Pineside and Snow King. We'd just try to get in as far as we could. And it really, it was just not far enough. Um, it just took so long to get up there. And so eventually I convinced David Anderson to loan me his snowmobile and that helped a lot. Um, but winter is hard. It makes for hard field work. Um, and I would snowmobile all around Mount Adams up to the wilderness boundary, often on my own. And then I would cross country ski or snowshoe, um, would backcountry ski up to tree line. I love this little video. It kind of captures how hard it can be some days. So it doesn't even look very steep, but this gal is just slowly slogging away. Uh, this was January 1st, 2017, and it snowed like two feet overnight. And then it snowed on us a foot when we were out there. It was just very slow going. Um, all right, so when the work got started in 2008, I began detecting a bunch of carnivores on Mount Adams. And so there's 14 carnivore species that occur on Mount Adams or on the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. So I'm gonna test your species identification chops starting here. So if you just wanna say it out loud in your living room. So what do we have here? Okay, black bear. Here's a mountain lion, should be easy, coyote, bobcats. Now this is a new guy to the Cascades. It was reintroduced to the Olympic Peninsula in 2008, and then it was reintroduced to down here, South Cascades in 2015 to the Randall and Packwood area. Um, this is a fisher and its smaller cousin, the Pacific Martin. Here we have a mink. You can see that on the trail, that little brown, it's got white underside and a black tip tail. This is a long tailed weasel. This is a grainy photo. These guys would always rip really fast across the camera's view. On the left there, you can see that white. This is an ermine or a short tailed weasel. And then we do have striped skunks. And then here's a species we've never detected on our cameras. This is the Western spotted skunk. It seems increasingly rare in our area. And everyone knows this guy, the raccoon, which we also have not detected, but it occurs on the forest. All right, so this guy. So the first, we started in the winter and the first winter rolled by, we had no luck. The whole second winter went by and it wasn't until the very end of that winter that we were able to finally capture a wolverine on the camera. It was a pretty neat moment. It was on the north side of Mount Adams. And so this was 15 months of work. We got one wolverine photo. 
But at the same time, during all that, that same period, the cameras were detecting these little foxes high on Mount Adams. And in the depths of winter, they were up there when almost nothing else lived up there. Now, when I go up into the mountains in the winter, it feels very remote and harsh. I'm sure many of you have experienced this. The landscape is just totally white and barren after a snowstorm. And often if there's been some kind of blizzard event, there's just no tracks, wildlife tracks up in the snow. Um, it feels like really, like critters just would really have a hard time living up there. And yet these foxes were regularly visiting the cameras. They were one of the only species that were coming to them. Now at this time, um, after about a year and a half of doing the camera work, I decided to head to the University of California at Davis to start my doctorate studying this fox. The Cascade Red Fox is one of the rarest mammals in Washington, but this fact was really not known um, always. When I began surveys on Mount Adams, very little was known about their ecology. So it was a great graduate project to dig into. The only study of the Cascade Red Fox had been conducted in and around Mount Rainier in the early 1980s by a doctoral student named Keith Aubrey. He was from the University of Washington. And when I got started, no research had been conducted in the 30 year period since he wrapped up his work. So here's a photo of Keith with one of the few collared foxes, Cascade Red Foxes that have ever been collared. This photo was probably taken in about 1980. And he just told me the other day that when he was getting started with his research, quote, I began my field work running remote cameras, movie cameras that took one 16 millimeter frame every 10 minutes or something, a stunningly primitive methodology to say the least. So in 1978, when Keith started, he was looking for foxes in the Cedar River watershed, which is east of Seattle. And he said, this is dense coniferous forest, not what we know today to be Cascade Red Fox habitat, which we now know it's subalpine parkland. So this is the habitats above and below and right at Timberline. So Keith really had nothing to go on, which kind of illustrates how, how we just really know very little about this, this neat fox, which I find totally amazing. Um, Keith told me that he wasted a whole field season, found no evidence of foxes whatsoever and had to move his study to Mount Rainier. So he was really just figuring out where these guys occurred. And he said that after being there for a month, quote, I was taking a walk at Mount Rainier. After being there for about a month, the sun was going down and I saw a Cascade Red Fox standing on the trail in the silver forest at sunrise. It was a revelation, he said, as it proved to me that I was finally working in the right place and that the Cascade Red Foxes were not extinct there just shows you how little he had to go on. And this black fox in the photo here, it was taken in the same silver forest this year on the north side of Mount Rainier by a professional photographer named Gretchen Stewart, who's working with us. So it's neat to know that this is, you know, one of the places to find them. And Keith spent three years studying the Cascade Red Fox, and he recognized a couple things. So first, red foxes occurred in the high mountains of the Western United States, but not in the Canadian Rockies. That was one thing. And he began digging into the red fox fossil and archeological record. Um, and he also noticed that mountain foxes up in the mountains were smaller than the larger red foxes in Canada. So he came up with this idea. He developed a hypothesis to explain these facts that helped to describe their evolutionary history, how they came into North America in the first place. Now, Keith Aubrey has become my mentor and I've slowly come to understand how unique and interesting and rare the Cascade Red Fox is. And I'd like to share their story with you. It is not, however, a simple story. The Red Fox has had a bum rap for as long as people have been telling stories. It is the trickster of folklore and is often persecuted as a pesky chicken killer in children's books to real life encounters with humans. 
The red fox has an omnivorous diet and an innate curiosity and is often considered a sly and devious predator. It is one of the most ubiquitous carnivores on earth with almost 50 subspecies worldwide. And it lives in many habitats from grassland to jungle to tundra. And it's considered a species of least concern by the World Conservation Union, which means that it's globally widespread and abundant. However, there are three subspecies of red fox that live high in the mountains of the American West in the Cascade, the Sierra Nevada, and the Rocky Mountains. And together, these three are the mountain foxes. They are distinct morphologically, so in their shape, their size, genetically and ecologically from all other red foxes on planet Earth. And the Cascade red fox does not just occur anywhere. It only lives in the Cascade Range and mainly from Mount Adams to Mount Rainier. So Keith had this unique theory about how the mountain foxes evolved. He came up with the idea in the early 1980s and it was later supported through DNA analysis by Keith and his genetic collaborators. It's a pretty neat story. So the colonization of the red fox into North America was shaped by two waves of migration across the Bering Land Bridge from the lands of Beringia, which are up in the top left there, the green, that were created during past ice, ice ages when the continental ice sheets caused the lowering of sea level and created an expansive region that is now partly under the ocean, but includes the lands of present day Russia and, Ala and Northern Alaska. So 300,000 years ago, during the second to last ice age, which is called the Illinoisan glaciation, the red fox first colonized North America over this Bering Land Bridge which was connected because sea level was lower. And when the ice sheets melted and the Bering Strait reformed, red foxes became isolated on two different continents. And the red foxes in North America, they, moved, they swept south and east across the boreal forests of Canada and into the Northern United States. Then during the most recent ice age, the Bering Land Bridge reformed and a second wave of red foxes migrated into North America. Now during this period, the ancestors of the mountain foxes, which were already in North America, they were pushed south of those purple ice sheets where the, to where the land was ice free in the Northern US. And on the windswept and sparsely treed plains, of the Western and Central United States, the foxes adapted to a cold glacial climate, which lasted 100,000 years. Now, when these ice sheets receded back to the poles, the foxes in the West, they didn't follow the melting ice sheets north, but instead they moved upslope into the mountains and are now the, and were, and were the ancestors of the mountain foxes, which are now living high in the Cascade, the Sierra Nevada, and the Rocky Mountain Ranges. And there they became isolated and diverged from the second wave of red foxes that was now making its way across the North American boreal forests. This second wave of foxes are the ancestors of lowland red foxes, which occur naturally throughout Alaska and Canada and the Eastern United States. And beginning in the late 1800s, they were brought west for fur farming and hound hunting. And over time, these lowland red foxes have escaped or they were released from captivity and their descendants are now living as non-native red foxes in many parts of the West. The Cascade red fox lives year round on the upper slopes of the Cascade volcanoes and at other high elevation sites such as the Goat Rocks Wilderness. They do not leave their snowy abode during the harshest blizzards of winter, nor do they interbreed with those lowland red foxes. They're finely tuned for life at altitude. They have these fur-lined feet and a small body mass, and they, and they may live at high elevations to avoid coyotes who do not move efficiently through deep snow and are a major competitor and predator of red foxes in the lowlands. 
And while the Rocky Mountain red fox is one of the three mountain foxes, has a more expansive plateau of high elevation habitat in the Rockies, the Sierra Nevada red fox and the Cascade red fox have very limited distributions occurring in pockets of high elevation habitat. And for reasons that I actually don't fully understand yet, they have been largely wiped out from the North Cascades ecosystem. So that's the Cascade Range in Washington, north of I-90. Many carnivores have disappeared from large areas of the American West during the last century due to overtrapping and predator control programs where poison bait was put out. Now populations of rare carnivores are slowly recovering and recolonizing portions of their historical ranges. But carnivores need large connected landscapes to roam and to find what they need to survive. And their habitats are, are rapidly changing as the climate warms. So my team and I are working to count foxes and understand how they are being impacted by climate change. Increasing amounts of rain on snow during the winter are changing the snowpack in the mountains. When these rain on snow events are followed by cold temperature, the snow sets up into an impermeable, impenetrable layer, which I'm sure some of you guys have experienced when you're out backcountry skiing or cross-country skiing. And this impenetrable surface layer makes it much easier for all sorts of animals to travel over the snow. More typically low elevation species like the coyote can capitalize on this hardened snowpack and travel where they were typically excluded due to deep snow. And this brings a new, a new competitor into the ecosystem. The snowpack is also being lost earlier in the spring, which presents an opportunity for carnivores that typically live at low elevations. Um, in the winter to move up earlier in the summer and compete for resources. That hardened and often the, just a smaller snowpack that we're experiencing with climate warming also lowers, it actually lowers the air temperature in the subnivian layer. So this is the zone under the snow. It's the air pocket just above the, um, the dirt and the ground. And this zone um, is where small mammals that are prey for many carnivores live. And when it gets too cold in the subnivian, many animals actually freeze to death. And these are the prey sources for foxes. Foxes also hunt for snowshoe hares and Douglas squirrels, which find shelter and rest in stands of mature high elevation conifers, so the subalpine firs and the white bark pines and the mountain hemlock that are up at treeline. However, climate warming and subsequent disease outbreaks have killed many of these large trees in the high cascades. We're really experiencing a loss of especially white bark pines. If you lose these trees, you lose the places that the animals need to survive, where they find shelter. Subalpine meadows are also very important for foxes to hunt in where they find small mammals. But these meadows are being encroached upon by young trees as the climate warms. My team and I have begun a new and challenging project to assess the effects of climate change on the key prey of the Cascade Red Fox and how fox relationships with other carnivores may be shifting as mountain habitats warm. We're using a genetic technique called DNA metaparcoding, which is pretty neat. So what it does is it sequences every piece, it reads every piece of DNA in a carnivore scat that we collect. And then we are, we are able to identify what it ate, what each carnivore scat, what the carnivore ate, and uh, which food species are more, most important for, for the species that we're interested in. This, um, then we will broadly assess how climate change is affecting those critical food, food sources. This will provide a picture of how vulnerable the Cascade Red Fox is to changes to their habitat that are affecting their prey and are due to climate change. Ultimately, I would like to understand how interactions between all carnivores and their prey species in mountain ecosystems are changing due to climate change. A lot is going on in the mountains, as you're well aware. Wolverines face similar, really similar challenges to the Cas to Cascade Red Foxes and are threatened by many of the same things. 
but they're larger creatures and they maintain huge territories in order to find the food they need. So it's definitely some different, different challenges studying them. Wolverines belong to one of the five families of terrestrial carnivore in North America. They're called mustelids. They're faculative scavengers. Now what that means is that they spend a lot of time scavenging for dead food but they will kill prey when the opportunity arises. This table is from a study that looked at the historical record of wolverines in the lower 48. Now, if you just scan the top um, table, top, the table at the top there, you can see Washington and you can see the date along the top and then the number of wolverines. So in the 1800s, this is the historical record. Um, there's numbers of wolverines. And then if you, if you come over to 1921, you see that there's none. So scientists found no records of wolverines in Washington by 1921. And just a spattering of them started to reappear in the 1960s. We think this is due to some long distance dispersals, but they were really wiped out by about 1920. But by about night, but in the 1990s, carnivore biologists realized that the wolverine had made a natural comeback in Washington. Wolverines had been extirpated, so wiped out from the state due to overharvest and predator control, as I mentioned earlier, um, that mainly targeted other species like wolves and bears, but um, wolverines were bycatch. Um, and they will be, you know, they could be wiped out again if we, if we don't try to understand how our presence on the landscape is affecting them, how it threatens them. Wolverines are intrepid animals. They live high in the Cascade Range and other wild, rugged places where many of us enjoy adventuring. Their territories can be over 400 square miles. And so to study them, you need to cover a lot of ground. Now, if we want to, uh, to, I just want to return to my research in 2009. That was when we got our first wolverine photograph on Mount Adams. And so in this, this was a period of, of a lot of exciting photographs, 2009, 2010. We documented the wolverine on Mount Adams, uh, first on the north side. And then we started picking it up on the south side, on the Aiken lava flow, um, to the north, up in the goat rocks. I did assume that it was a male and we nicknamed him Wildy. Now, the reason I assumed he was a male was because it's often the males that make these very long distance dispersals and they show up first in new places, but we never knew for sure if he was a male. We also, I could never be sure that each of these sightings was actually Wildy and that there weren't an other, we weren't detecting another Wolverine. We were pretty sure for the most part um, based on his markings, but we just couldn't be sure all the time. And it was super frustrating. Um, a big part of understanding if a species is recolonizing an area is knowing that they are successfully reproducing and growing. So just having one male roaming an area is not the establishment of a new population. So we adopted a new station design. Um, it, was it was created by Audrey McGowan, who is a Wolverine expert from Alaska, and it's called a run pool. And it can do, so this, this is the diagram setup of what it looks like. It can do four things. So first of all, it can identify Wolverines. It can detect Wolverines and identify individuals. So you can know who's who. It can collect hair samples from these wire brushes that are on the setup and it can determine the sex of the wolverine. And if we're lucky, it can also determine their reproductive status. So for example, we can detect a lactating female at, and if at a certain time of year we see her, this indicates that she has kits in a den nearby. So the run pool is on the left. It is a, a piece of two by four lumber, or it can be a, a lodgepole pine that we cut down in the woods. And it's affixed horizontally to a tree with a brace. And it has these upright uh, two by twos that have um, wire brushes and some other features I'll show you in the next slide. On the right, we have one or two cameras on the tree facing square onto this setup. And then the tricky part is cabling, is putting, setting up this, this wire cable at the top between two trees, the camera tree and the run pole tree. And then we hang bait 
from the setup to get the Wolverine to come out onto the run pole and look up at the bait. Here's the crew carrying the gear into the field. This We are actually just in the middle of our fifth winter season deploying these Wolverine specific monitoring stations. We've set 28 of them from Mount Adams to the headwaters of the Little Natchez River, which is just south of I-90 and Snoqualmie Pass. Uh, what I want to know is how many wolverines there are south of I-90, which areas they use, and how many breeding females there are so that we can get a handle on, a, on the trend in the population. Is it growing? Is it going to blink out? And how can we prevent that? Do we need to restore land to connect it to more stable populations? Do we need safer routes for them to cross I-90? Do we need to restrict access by humans at key times of year to protect the places they den and give birth? To understand how stable the population is, our research is aimed at understanding if wolverines here are reproducing at a rate that will produce a healthy population. We hope to detect virtually every individual wolverine living in the, in the South Cascades and see who is reproducing how many offspring they're producing, how are the babies doing? These are called kits. Are they surviving once they leave the den? And if they are surviving, are they reproducing themselves? So here's a photo of the actual setup. So you have the run pole on the left there. On the right is one of the crew, Scott, he's climbing the tree to set the camera. And you can see, um, Right here is the bait is all snowy. The cable is just kind of, it's over here and um, out of the frame. And so the Wolverine comes out and it puts its paws up on this crossbar here as it tries to get up and eat the bait. Here's a close up of the hair snagging setup. So we have these wire brushes and we also have alligator clips that clip onto another alligator clip. And when they get triggered, they get a little hair sample off of the Wolverine and it falls off so we can, we can ideally tie that to individual Wolverines. The study area is divided into the squares, 90, square, 90 miles squared approximately. That's uh, how we've gridded out the landscape. And then we set at least one of these stations in each square. So looking out across this landscape from maps, and then when I'm in the field, I try to think about how a wolverine might move across uh, from one high elevation spot to another, travel corridors, what it's doing, and where we can set these stations and actually get wolverines in that square, um, and then having enough of the squares occupied with a camera so that we can that we can feel confident that we're detecting most individuals in the area. All right, so here is a photo showing what we're aiming for. The wolverine climbs the tree and out onto the run pole, it raises its head and its paws to display its chest and its belly. By 2018, we had documented four wolverines across the study area this way, and here are two of them. So you can see that they have very different chest blazes. That's the white markings under their chin there and on their chest. On the left was this new male. So this is not Wildy, the Mount Adams Wolverine, but another male, a new one. And then on the right is this female that we nicknamed Pepper that we first documented in 2017. So a decade after the Yakima Wolverine on Mount Adams, we got a female. It took 10 years. And this was a big deal, confirming a population was starting. In the red box, you can see she has enlarged teats. And this is how we knew that she was lactating and that we should look for her den. For five years, I worked with these two wildlife biologists that were with the Forest Service at the time. And it's really their grit that contributed to what happened next. And they actually got married this fall, which was kind of neat. Uh, you can see in the bottom there, that's their wedding cake. On the top, they had these two little Wolverine <laughs> figurines. So after we found out that this first Wolverine pepper, first Wolverine in a decade, 
of us searching that she was lactating, Scott and Kayla returned to the area where they'd set the station. And we were very fortunate because the conditions were just right. This was May, 2018. And it often, you know, it's the end of winter in the mountains. It does not snow very readily. But if it were to snow, then tracks would be laid down by animals moving around. And it just happened to snow like a couple centimeters right after they came back from learning that she had been lactating. So the conditions were very, were good. Were good. We, they were just right. And through their tenacity and hard work, they found Pepper's tracks deep in the snow, um, in the snow deep in the William O. Douglas Wilderness, which is a wilderness area to the east of Mount Rainier. And they were able to follow her tracks to her den. So here is the first female and her two kits documented in the South Cascades in a hundred years. All right, and so here's what the den looks like um, when we visited in May. This den is the first Wolverine den documented in the South Cascades, so south of I-90. And it's only the third den ever found in Washington, in the Washington Cascades. It's also one of the only dens that's found in North America without actually capturing and handling and collaring a wolverine. So it was quite a hard thing to do. Here is the den when I returned in September. It was a very complex site. There is a low cavity that ran deep into those boulders. It was really well protected. So the Wolverine Mama, she would have dug down into the snowpack in February to excavate this site. The official birthday of the Wolverine is Valentine's Day. Females give birth in a den protected under the snowpack sometime between January and March with mid-February being pretty typical. So Valentine's Day. And this, so this den is located at the base of the snowpack where there is some structure, you know, Wolverine dens, they'll, they'll dig into the snowpack where there's some kind of structure. Um, they don't dig into the ground, but that rather they use the snowpack as protection from predators and for warmth. So Pepper would have, we think, known about the site in the summer, maybe. This is me conjecturing, but it seems like it makes sense. And then in the winter, she would have dug down to the spot, knowing that it was a good place to have a den, which I find amazing. Um, King Five News came out with us when we returned to collect scats. This is Scott inside the den. Um, if we we were hoping that we could get a scat, we could get scats from the kits, and then we would get their genetic signatures. And this would allow us to track them into the future if we got hair samples from them at some of our other stations, then we could track their survival over time. The discovery of Pepper and her family was a really exciting time. But by the end of that summer, we had stopped detecting them and I think they probably perished. The next year or so was quite demoralizing. We'd gone from one Wolverine to five Wolverines and back to maybe one. And I was worried that we were on our way to zero. But then at the very end of 2019 in Mount Rainier National Park, we documented this Wolverine new to the Cascades, to the South Cascades. It is not one of the, the six Wolverines that we had documented during the past decades. And from genetic samples that we got from her hair, we later, from its hair, <laughs> we later learned it shared the same genetic lineage with wolverines from the North Cascades. So it had likely crossed the checkerboard of logged and restored landscapes at Snoqualmie Pass to make it to the protected habitat of Mount Rainier National Park. I-90 is a very significant barrier for wildlife cutting through the middle of the Cascades. It creates a challenging link for connecting wolverine populations in the north and the south. So it is with hope that we think wolverines are successfully crossing this major highway. This is the new wolverine. It's actually sniffing me and some folks that were out with me that day. We showed up on the camera eight minutes after this little video was taken. So she, we almost came up upon her and she hightailed it out of there before we got there. 
In mid-February of last year, 2020, the new Wolverine returned to the same station and I could see that she was a female and that she was also lactating, making her the second documented reproductive female Wolverine south of I-90. We nicknamed her Joni because she was found near Paradise, one of the spots on Mount Rainier. Wolverines were first documented returning to Mount Rainier in 2017 when a scat collected at a pica colony on the eastern edge of the park was confirmed to be peppers. But this new female means wolverines are breeding in the park and not simply dispersing through. From the pattern of her repeated visits to this station, we could tell that her den wasn't nearby like peppers had been but it wasn't too, too far away either. And that it was likely inside the park. So we began looking for it. We tried to figure out which direction it could be located, but then COVID hit soon after that. And we were really limited in our ability to work in the park just for a period of time. And so we never did locate her den, but we did, we did have a good idea of where it might be. And in June of 2020, Joni visited another of our stations at Mount Rainier bringing her two young kids. So this is the second family in the South Cascades. And Scott and I were lucky enough to actually see Joni in, in May moving between the den site and our monitoring station. Here she is. Following the arrival of Joni, we detected a new male in the Goat Rocks wilderness last summer. So another huge contribution to the gene pool. And then in early 2021, a snowmobiler shared this track with me from the south side of Mount Adams. We're pretty sure it's a Wolverine track. Um, I had not heard of a Wolverine on Mount Adams since late 2016. So this, repo this report here may mark the return of Wolverines to the mountains. I was hoping that we would um, find the Wolverine at one of our stations, uh, but we haven't yet. We're still trying. So along with Joni's two kits from last year, which we know are males and this new male, the population is slowly growing. However, there are no other females than Joni. New females will likely have to cross I-90 to arrive here and help expand the population. So it's a tall order. This year we were curious, all of us, if Joni would reproduce again. Wolverines can reproduce um, two years in a row. So a friend of mine from Hood River, Katie Shear, and I headed up to Mount Rainier to where we thought the den might have been from last year. And then to, and we, we set up um, some, we re-upped re this camera station that we had there that we knew would have died over the winter. We put new batteries and a card in it and freshened the bait. And then two weeks after that, Kayla and I returned to the site and got this video. We're not positive, but we, we are hopeful that one of them is a female. They, they appear, we've watched, we've monitored them across the summer and they appear to be slightly different sized in their early days. Um, so we're hopeful and we'll be documenting them through this fall and winter and seeing where they show up. So this is Wolverine country. The landscape around Treeline provides a place for wolverines to forage on voles and gophers in subalpine meadows to scare up snowshoe hares in the stands of mature high elevation conifers to capture marmots and pikas in talus slopes and to seek out mountain goat carcasses found at the base of cliffs and avalanche chutes. Wolverines also do descend lower in elevation to find elk and deer killed during harsh winter storms, cold snaps, or by predators and humans, such as hunters. As part of our community science program, we are collecting scat samples from wolverines and foxes. So please consider joining us in this effort next summer. We are sorting and archiving over a million wildlife photos this winter also. You can reach out to us on our website. Please get in touch also 
if you ever see wolverine tracks or are lucky enough to see a wolverine or a cascade red fox we really rely on the public to support our efforts but where do we go from here? We have this wolverine population showing up again in the Cascades after a long absence of a hundred years. We have a rare and imperiled fox that lives here and almost nowhere else. How are we going to protect them so they don't disappear? We have these really amazing carnivores right in our own backyard. And our goal is to figure out what they require to survive so they'll always find a home here. We hope you will help us do that. Just want to end with a shout out to everyone that collaborates with us and supports our work. Um, it takes an army. And that's it. Thank you so much for joining me. Jocelyn, I knew I knew a lot of this story and I still feel like I just learned four times as much as I already knew. And, and, it, and I'm just as excited and want to wave my hands in excitement as usual. Um, I want to remind everyone that if you have questions, now's the time to put them in the Q&A box and we will start working our way through those. Um, and I also want to let you know that we will have the link to Cascades Carnivore Project in our show notes um, on the website. And you can also just Google Cascades Carnivore Project so you can keep track of what they're doing and um, the new photos they're finding. So I wanted, I want to start by asking you, can you tell in a little bit more detail, you talked about how we have this landscape and it's divided into these 90, you know, mile squares and you have to try to get a station one per square. And what sort of criteria are you using when you walk into that square and need to decide where do I set this up? What are you trying to pay attention to to figure out where's the best place to put this or it'll have the most likelihood of documenting a wolverine or a fox? Good question. Um, so I spent a lot of time pouring over maps first, getting a lay of the landscape, but really you need, or I like to be out there looking at the landscape, getting up high and just, it, it's, when you break it down, it's not so complicated. You, you have to, you, you know that these carnivores live at high elevation. They like to spend time up there. The wolverine moves over much larger landscapes, so it's going to come down. So if it's going to come down, where is it going to go? If it's at, um, in the goat rocks and it wants to get into towards Mount Rainier, it needs to find a place where there's not too many humans, where it can stay high as long as possible and not have to go too low. And so it's just really a matter of reading the landscape, the terrain and guessing. And the stations are baited. So that brings them in. If you were just to plop something down in the forest, it wouldn't be as likely to, to attract carnivore. Um, someone is wondering, let's see, have you been able to determine what percentage of the red fox and wolverines populations um, has been impacted by climate change pressures? Do you have any sense of that or, or are you not even to that point? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tall order. It's a big thing to unpack. Um, we, I mean, I really tried to highlight how Keith started his research. Like he didn't even know where to find them. When I started it, it just, we, we, nobody knew they were on Mount Adams. We just, we, we just happened to detect them while looking for wolverines. And so a handful of foxes have even been collared, you know, had um, and studied. And so we know some things about what they eat. So we want to sort of understand what they eat, how that is being impacted by climate change. It's certainly the snow. Snow is a really important thing for these creatures. And we know the snow is being impacted. It, the, the pattern of snow coming down in the mountain over the winter is changing disappearing earlier and so no we don't know exactly what's happening but we know these species rely upon snow and so we're trying to slowly unpack that story um speaking you mentioned the collar piece have have there been has there been any collaring of the cascade red foxes to be able to understand their home ranges and genetics and all that information or do you foresee any of that in the future yeah, so, so Keith collared a handful of foxes in the 80s with radio collars. So you have to be out there listening to the ping, ping, ping with your little 
um, transceiver and then triangulating an approximate location where they are. So you basically, anytime you want to know where they are, you have to go out and like wander around three different spots. So, so he learned some really basic stuff, um, but there's a lot more to learn. There was a couple foxes collared at Mount Rainier about a decade ago, but these foxes were all associated with a few areas where people congregate at Rainier and where we have a couple foxes that are actually quite habituated to humans. So my hope is that we can study them across the South Cascades because what I did learn during my doctorate was that they, where we thought there was like a, a fox on the south side of Mount Adams, and then we get a scat on the north side. I would have thought those are two different individuals, but those are the same. Those turned out in certain instances to be the same individual. So we, we need to kind of expand our understanding of how big an area they roam. So where all of a sudden you think you have many individuals, you actually maybe only have one in this much larger area. So it seems like there's a lot less. And so we, we would like to do a, a collaring study where we're covering the whole South Cascades. Related to that, uh, we've got a few questions and you talked about the boundary of I-90. And I think sometimes that's an obstacle that people don't think about for wildlife, that a, a freeway can literally create a huge boundary that keeps populations separate. And I know there's the idea of sky islands. Will you talk some about how those the highways cause problems and um, what can be done or is being done to help eliminate some of that and maybe maybe share the story of the um, the Wolverine kit. Yeah. Um, we think a lot about climate change, but there are other things that are threatening these carnivores and it is like running the gauntlet to cross I-90. There is an incredible project, the I-90 Wildlife Bridges. So they built three overpasses over I-90, giant corridors for wildlife um, that will be treed and, and have shrubs and just like a natural way for them to cross. There's cameras that are monitoring those. No wolverines or foxes have been documented crossing there yet. Um, there was a wolverine killed on I-90 a few years ago. So we know that it's it's tricky business for carnivores to cross I-90. Um, Joni had her two sons in 2020 and we followed them all through the winter through our camera stations. Um, we even documented one of them on April 2nd, 2020. And then on April 17, I got an email that he had been hit by a car in the Yakima Canyon. So that's South Ellensburg. Um, so, to me, I think roads are a huge issue for wolverines, especially as they're reestablishing themselves in the contiguous United States, because they need to move to find mates. They need to move out of where they were born if they're males and set up shop somewhere else. And that often requires crossing these really busy highways. What's the most common predator for the Cascade Red Fox? <sighs> Good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Coyotes, there, there's some kind of antagonism with coyotes that is, it's all like this shifting landscape where we, the, the wolves, wolves were wiped out from Washington. Coyotes have really expanded across North America. And, uh, and that includes moving up into the mountains. And we now see coyotes where we see foxes, where they probably weren't there before. So are, are foxes able to avoid them or are, how much are they killed? by coyotes. We, we suspect that that would probably be the main predator um, of the fox. Wolverines, uh, like as I said, they, 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 they leave their natal territory and they roam and they have to set up shop somewhere else. There was uh, a wolverine that was killed by a cougar out of the North Cascade. So certainly the large, large cats, like if you're um, coming up, up upon carcasses as a wolverine, the, the, car the carcass, a kill of a, a cougar or a bear, um, depending on how young you are and what you've learned about life, you know, it, it can be a dangerous place to be. So there's certainly the larger carnivores or predators of these smaller mid-sized carnivores. What's the average lifespan of the Cascade Red Fox and also of the Wolverines? Do we know? Yeah. So a lot of what we, we, like we infer a lot from other Red Foxes. So maybe five years, um, for for both of them there's there are a handful of long-lived wolverines that are 11 12 years old we think wildy 
was probably 11. There's a, there's a Wolverine named Buddy that showed up north of Lake Tahoe a decade ago. He, he was what monitored for many years. He was at least 11. The, the lone Wolverine in the Wallawas, Stormy, he's uh, I think 12 now, maybe 13. So um, there are these long lived examples, but on average, we're, we're thinking more the average lifespan for a population of of these two carnivores is, is probably five, five or so years. Has there been any thought or um, work done about uh, to try to collar wolverines? Would that even be possible? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we I worked on that Yellowstone project trapping and collaring wolverines. Um, when when wild wolverine biologists in Washington realized that oh the wolverine is back in the 1990s. After about a decade, they started a, a collaring project, so the North Cascades Wolverine Study, and that ran for ten years. And I rely, I look at their literature all the time because it helps me to understand how carnivore, how wolverines live, survive, occur, what their biology is like in the Cascade Range. Um, we've got we've got someone asking you why is it a red fox and not a black fox so talk, maybe talk <laughs> about the, the colors yeah. of the cascade red fox <laughs> yeah so there's there's three primary morphs or color phases of the cascade red of, of red foxes um there there's the typical red that you you see mostly on a, on a in a winter scene on a calendar and then there's the black fox, which is also the black phase of the red fox, which is also called a silver fox by trappers because it's kind of these grizzled ends, tips to its hairs. And then there's a fox that you would have seen in some of the photos, the cross fox. So it, it's not it's not cross halfway in between them, but it's it has red and it has black on it. Um, so those are those are most common in the lowlands. Um, you get the red, the red phase the most, but there's something going on in the mountains where we get a lot more of the black foxes. So you know it's a red fox because it has a white tip tail. So if you're ever out and you see, is it a coyote or wolf or a, sorry, or a fox or a gray fox, just try and try and look for the tail. The tip of the tail is always white for red foxes. And then they have some other features like you can see here, the black tips of the ears on the back of the ears. And, and there and there's a whole gamut of colors. I know there's a fox at lunch, at lunch counter on Mount Adams in past years that was tan colored. Um, did you ever recover genetics from Pepper's Den? Yes, we did. Yep, okay. we got one scat, and we we presume that was um, it was a male, and we presume that was her male kit. And she, yeah, so she had the two kits, and um, that we just never saw them enough to see them grow up and figure out their their sex. Um, talk to me about both of these carnivores in Oregon. We've focused on Washington tonight. Yeah. Okay. So, um, there is one Wolverine known in Oregon in the Wallowas. That's that one stormy. There is a big survey coming up this winter in Oregon to look for Wolverines, but none have been documented. in I don't even, in, since the sixties, um, in on Mount Hood is the Sierra Nevada red fox. So they used to think red foxes in the mountains in the Cascade, so all the way down through Oregon were the Cascade red fox. But then genetics showed they're actually they're actually linked the same related um, to the Sierra Nevada red fox that occurs on Mount Lassen and in uh, Yosemite. Um, so there are some on Mount Hood. Um, probably on Jefferson, though they haven't been documented. And there, there is actually a coloring, a, a project studying them around around Bend, around Bachelor and north of there. Um, someone's worried about the idea of could a female Wolverine, could we just introduce one into the area and sort of jumpstart things? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just was uh, in a meeting yesterday talking about reintroducing links into Northern Washington. So yes, it's possible. Yes, people talk about these things. Um, you know, it takes a lot of time to decide if it's a good idea or not. But yes, it is certainly possible and it would certainly kickstart <laughs> the population down here. Will you remind us the last time you detected Pepper? Yeah, so Pepper, I mean, she was detected in June of 2018 and I was looking through the photos and I realized at the very end, 
there were these photos of just one of the kits. So I believe that maybe she died with one of the kits and the other one was just kind of hanging out for a little while um, and then probably perished. I mean, it's possible they're still alive, but I don't think so. Um, let's see. Someone's asking, if I see a wolverine or a cascade red fox, who should we call? What should we do? And, and how can we convey that information in a way that might be useful to whoever we reach out to? Love yeah, so you, you can always reach out on our website. We record, I, I, can, I handle the database of red fox detections in Washington and um, Northern Oregon. We, we have a group, the Washington Wolverine Research and Monitoring Group, where we, we keep track of all wolverine sightings in the state. Um, yeah, we use public sightings to really inform just to add to what we the picture that we are painting we we um it's super helpful if you report your wolverine sighting we don't share them with anyone other than this core group of wolverine biologists and just so you know for all of you who wrote in and and you know said where you'd seen wolverines or red foxes we'll gather that information joss joss can see it we'll share that with her um, as well We've got a couple questions from two of your younger viewers tonight. Reed, who's age six, wants to know, do wolverines eat red fox? Oh! And then related, <laughs> Aaliyah, age eight, wants to know, do the foxes eat the wolverines? So Great questions. Talk okay. to Reed and Aaliyah. Well, okay, Reed, thanks for tuning in. I would have said, I don't think wolverines eat red foxes, but we got a report with actual video from a member of the public that was hiking on Mount Rainier and it shows our Wolverine family. So Joni and her two kids, and they're kind of batting around this carcass that I just assumed was a marmot. But if you kind of zoom in and look close, it looks like it might be a fox. And some people I shared it with think it's a fox and some people don't. So I could see them getting in a tussle maybe over a, a, a carcass. Um, I do not believe a fox could kill a wolverine, Aaliyah. I think that would be a tall order. Wolverines are very um, tough, wily, fast animals. So I think it would be hard, really hard for a fox to get one. Um, someone else is wondering why we're on the topic. Would you say that wolverines are your favorite animal? <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. I mean, I, I love wolverines. Yeah, for sure. But I also find these red foxes pretty incredible. And yeah. I... Um, do you know, is there research being done on the prey populations of the wolverines and the foxes? Um, some, a little bit. Yeah. We, we're hoping to start some prey studies. It's just, it's a lot of work, you know, to, to, prey are just kind of all, you know, they're, they're across the landscapes trying to figure out, yes, there are some studies, but the, much more is needed. Yeah, for sure. Especially down here in the South Cascades, there's very little. Um, with so few wolverines, I think the same probably goes for foxes. Do we worry about genetic diversity or is that a luxury at this point? Yeah, we certainly do. And I mean, I have a background in genetics and that's a particular interest of mine. Um, we, there is a, a, a big genetic study going on to look at how wolverines recolonize Washington um, and look at the levels of, of genetic diversity. It's, um, yeah, it's definitely something, it's really important part of monitoring um, the conservation of the species. And, and for the foxes, we, we do see, my, in, my, in my graduate work, I showed that there's quite a level of inbreeding in the Cascade Red Fox. And you know, they, they probably can get across I-90 sometimes, but they're really, there is a lack of immigration across that. And so, yeah, that they're, they're not, there is some, they're, they're not very genetically diverse, yeah. Um, another question from, from a younger viewer. Um, I think it's probably from Nora, age seven, and she is wondering, what does it feel like when you bring back that SD card from one of your cameras that's been out there for months and you put it in your computer and you start looking at the photos for the first time? 
Thanks, Nora, for tuning in also. And thanks for this question. Uh, I find it very exciting, very exciting to look at the photos. Um, I mean, if you get a Wolverine or a fox, it just kind of makes my day. But there's all sorts of other cool things. We get the fishers and we get Martin and we get bears and cougars. And I mean, I, I consider it a really fun part of my job to be scrolling through all these photos and seeing what's out there that I never got to see, but it's on the landscape. Um, someone asked about the Wolverine in Long Beach. Oh, yeah. Can you say anything about it? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, a Wolverine showed up in Long Beach, Washington about a year ago. We were so hoping we would get a genetic sample and say it came from British Columbia. It came from the North Cascades. Oh, it's Pepper's son. Uh, it feasted on an elephant seal carcass. Some biologists collected all these poops from around the carcass, but none of them yielded a successful genetic signature. It, it showed up to the north of Long Beach once quite soon thereafter, and it's never been seen that I'm aware of since. So very mysterious. Hmm. How far have, have, how far south have wolverines been documented? Okay, so uh, yeah, okay, so, um, north of Lake Tahoe, one male that they believe came from the Sawtooth of Idaho, it's probably died now, and then um, a wolverine from that was collared in Grand Teton National Park made its way into Colorado. So I think Tahoe is probably south, but at the most south, and then Colorado and Mount Adams is in the Wallowas. Yeah. Um, Okay, I'm going to try to, I, I want to watch our time and also let you get back to your family. So I'm going to just zip through a few here. Um, last questions. Have there been any reliable sightings of the Cascade Red Fox north of I-90 I in recent decades? Yes, great question. Um, there, I used to say there, there were six detections north of I-90 in 40 years. So 40 years of all sorts of research on grizzly bears, wolverines, lynx, black bears, and martin only yielded six detections. And then last year we got a new one near Lake Chelan. Um, and just this March, we have two photos really close together on the Loomis State Forest, which is up east of the Pesaten, up way up north by the Canadian border. We were able to get one genetic sample from a fox scat at Stevens Pass. So it's this crazy just just little blips all disparate and and then we never we follow up with cameras and we never detect them again so the more we're getting it's very exciting and hopeful but it's really hard to figure out what's going on are you finding that more people are diving in to help do the research and and projects as your research has has grown more and you've had more detections yeah for sure um in 2008, like no, like wildlife biologists didn't know what a cask, like the word cascade red fox, barely any knew. And now there's this fox named Whitefoot that I just nicknamed in 2011 because I saw her at Mount Rainier. And she is on Instagram, hashtag Whitefoot. Like you see her all the time. She's a, she's an old habituated fox, but and people don't just say, oh, I saw this critter or I saw this fox. They say, I saw this cascade red fox. And so people are understanding what these things are and how rare they are. And, and yeah, slowly, slowly getting the word back to us. Related to that, what, what do you see moving forward? And I know this is, this is um, a hot, hot thing, a hot topic to bring up, but putting pressure on the powers that be to get um, any, either or these carnivores listed on the endangered species list. Yeah, so a big part of what I what we're trying to do right now is put a number to how many foxes there are south of I-90. Because it's one thing to sort of understand that there's not very many of them, but it's really numbers that speak. And so the, the state is actually doing a, a review, a status review, it's called, that I'm helping to inform with our data. Um, I mean, it is a big effort of of myself and others that care about the Cascade Red Fox to just provide the data to show that there's a need for listing. The, very, I mean, very interestingly, and I, and I find hopeful is the, the Sierra Nevada Red Fox 
was listed on the federal endangered species list this year. Oh, okay. The Cascade Red Fox is in a very similar plight. I think it's just a matter of just continuing to push, push, push. So, yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to burn through the last few here. Um, how might Western, Western gray wolves impact the wolverines or maybe even the foxes as well? Yep. Um, a lot of research done on the return of wolves to Yellowstone and how it impacts foxes. They, wolves typically reduce the number of coyotes, which releases the foxes from competition and maybe predation. Um, it's been shown that large carnivores on the landscape, whether it's wolves or cougars or bears, they create more carcasses of elk and deer on the landscape, which helps all carnivores and many, many other species. So it should be a good thing. There will be probably some mortality for sure though. Um, on the fishers, I know we didn't talk to them too much about, talk about them too much tonight, but are they considered rare in Washington? Yeah, so the fisher was totally wiped out from Washington over trapping. They have the most luxurious fur. They were reintroduced. I just found out, I just heard yesterday, 250 plus fisher have been reintroduced to Washington from uh, British Columbia and Alberta. So there's somewhere less than that in the state now, because obviously there's been some mortality. Um, there has been documented reproduction, very little. Uh, yes, they are on the, the Washington endangered species list. Um, one last question. Can you confirm for Callan and Perry, there are a couple young ones again. So all the markings on the Wolverine's chest, remind us what that's called and what's yeah. so unique about it. Okay. Cal, Perry, thanks for joining us. Awesome. So good to, to know you're out there. Um, Wolverines are mostly dark brown, black. They have a band of white that goes around their butt, along their sides, and then underneath on their throat and their chest, they have white markings that we call the chest blaze. And each Wolverine has a unique one. So if you're able to get a good photo, you can compare it to other photos that you have and you can identify individuals. Okay, last thing is to everyone listening who was inspired and excited, what are the top two things you want folks watching this to go out and do? Please support us, jo join our efforts in any way that inspires you and tell your friends about how cool Cascade Red Foxes and Wolverines are. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Thank you so much to your team as well who've been doing very hard and important research. And thanks for coming out of the mountains tonight to join us here. <laughs> thanks <laughs> so much, guys. We loved it. Thank Good you night, all. Everyone.